thank you very much to uh, to Hitz and to uh, to, to uh, in particular also to Anna for inviting me to come and, and give this talk here. So uh, indeed, I will try to aim to describe to you what is the role of moduli space, in particular quantum geometry of moduli spaces in the context of quantum field theory, and hopefully also manage to cover some of the applications we made, not to physics, but actually to uh, molecular biology. So let's get started. So um, here is the plan for the talk, and I will be very happy if we cover well part one, and some selection of the rest of the parts. So just to be forewarned uh, uh, about a number of slides. But let's uh, get started. So the first one is just a very gentle introduction to what is quantum field theory and uh, Fein Feynman path integrals. And it will be on a very overall level. But what I can tell you is that, well, we do have the standard model, which is the current best model which describes all the fundamental forces including strong and weak forces and electromagnetism. However, it does not cover gravity of course. And this theory as you well know has had this fantastic success that it predicted the Higgs boson long before it was discovered and then at CERN they really discovered this Higgs boson. Now, how are these, uh, how is this related to this Feynman path integrals? Well, if you have some observable then the idea of Feynman path integrals is that you take an integral over some space, and what is the integral over? Well, you have some infinite dimensional space of fields in the theory that describes all the particles and matter and content and so on there is in the theory. But you are dividing by a huge symmetry group. So there is an infinite dimensional symmetry group that acts on the theory, so it acts on the space of fields, and the very important thing that also determines how everything interacts is the L here, the Lagrangian, and that is a well-defined function on the quotient. So therefore it makes sense to exponentiate it, say e to the i, this Lagrangian, times the observable, and the observable is a function on the space of fields and it is gauge invariant. And then you simply perform an integral like this, and then you normalize the integral by where you're looking at the observable one. So this is the kind of typical thing that one has in quantum field theory. Now, the, how do we perform these integrals? And so if you just look at this integral like this here, we simply do not know how to perform such integrals. They are not part of the mathematical armor of what we can do. We can even prove that in this context here, these measures don't exist. So these do not exist in math. But the physicists know how to do it. And uh, uh, Richard Feynman was really uh, a pioneer in this area here. And one of the main ideas is the following. You take this Lagrangian, and this Lagrangian typically has a scale in front of it, a coupling constant. In this case, you have just schematically called it h bar as Planck's constant. And what you are interested in is maybe merely the behavior as this quantity here goes to zero, because we all know the Planck's constant is very small, so if we're able to somehow describe how this thing is for very small h-bar, maybe we can understand this. And actually, this is all that people can do with the standard model. They have no exact definition of this, I repeat, no mathematical definition of that. But what they can do is somehow treat it when h-bar goes to zero. And here's part of what they do. So the main idea is simply just treat it as if it was a finite dimensional oscillatory integral. So just imagine that this is simply a finite dimensional oscillatory integral. What we know about such oscillatory integrals is that if you are not at a stationary point, so a point where the derivative of L is zero, the oscillations will wash out each other when you average. It's only at the places where the oscillations are not there, namely at the stationary point. So to the first order, the thing doesn't oscillate. So where the derivative of L is zero, that's where the main contribution from this thing will come. So, therefore, you look at this Lagrangian and you look at all of the places where its derivative is zero. This typically becomes a PDE in the field, and this describes, you know, the classical evolution of the field. So you look at the solutions, so you look at all the fields for which the derivative is zero, and because L is G invariant, this is preserved by this big group G that's acting, and the quotient space is exactly the moduli space 
of classical solutions. Moduli, because it's modulo a group action. Because if you just take this whole set of solutions here, this is infinite dimensional, but when you divide by the group, very often this might become finite dimensional. Not always, but in good cases it does. Okay, and so the thing is that this is not the end of the story. This was just some like, classical consideration. But what you then have to do is you have to consider certain kinds of graphs, namely Feynman diagrams. And the idea is the following, that you look at a certain finite set of, they are fat graphs of a certain genus. I will get back to what these notions mean. You don't really need to know what I mean right now. But there are a certain finite set of graphs for these. And then for each graph, there is some contribution to, for this graph. And it is typically of the form you integrate some uh, form over this moduli space. And this integral here is a finite dimensional integral in uh, the cases that one considers. And after some renormalization, because in fact, if you take the standard model and just naively apply this mechanism, you will get infinities even at this finite level. But after a renormalization process, it's actually in a situation where the contribution from each uh, Feynman diagram is finite, and then you sum up all the contributions over the graphs of a, of a certain, for a certain G, we call it genus at the moment, later we will know why it's called a genus, and then the idea is that the quantity we wanted from before, this observable, is simply given approximately as some infinite sum where you take the contribution for the terms of, uh, 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 of genus G, you take h bar to some power, a beta is fixed here, some real number, and you sum g equals zero to infinity, and then you have some prefactor in front, h bar to some power. So this process works very well. I mean, it works to up to about 10 decimals when you measure the standard model. So one could say, oh, that's great, you know, end of story. However, uh, this method does not always work, and it has severe shortcomings. One of the things is that this series here is not convergent. So typically, when you want to approximate something, you first somehow try to say, OK, it's roughly so much. And then you try to approximate a little finer, and a little finer, and a little finer, and a little finer. And eventually, you get very, very close to what you want to approximate. Now, in this case here, what happens is that you get some contribution first step, then you get some contribution there first step, and then it gets a little smaller, but then it starts accelerating. It becomes much, much, much bigger, and it just becomes arbitrarily big. So what are we doing? I mean, we're trying to f approximate some concrete and uh, constant in nature, and our best approximation is infinity when we really take the series seriously. So, I mean, that's ridiculous. And that's what I'm saying here, that the rate of divergence typically like g factorial or something like this, and so it is convergent for no value of h bar. So when we take mathematically this seriously, it's, it's really bad. If we just think of it as this series. So that's, of course, mathematically totally unsatisfactory. One could say from a physics point of view, who cares? We got the right result that we measured. Uh, well. You also have problems in physics, namely, first of all, the amount of computer power you need to compute these is horrendous. It's extremely inefficient to do it via the original Feynman path integral point of view with these Feynman graphs. There are tons and tons of graphs. And you know, some of the computations are 80 pages of long, 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 long computations. It takes an you know, enormous amount of PhD students and postdocs to do all of this. <laughs> so uh, uh, just for even low G. The th and if the theory is not renormalizable, the whole scheme doesn't even get off the ground. OK. It, and then the worst thing, I guess, from a physics point of view is it is totally inconsistent with Einstein's general relativity. So uh, today, we don't know a theory that really can incorporate, incorporate a quantization of gravity at the same time as it is consistent with the standard model. This is a huge problem. String theory is the current best candidate for that, but it really fails to live in full. It has not provided for us a theory that really is consistent with everything. OK, so uh, I should say, just uh, since you mentioned the ERC synergy grant, that uh, 
we are working on an attempt to define uh, Feynman path integrals, which will use resurgence and nonlinear Riemann Hilbert problems in combination with techniques from Fukaya categories. But uh, the grant doesn't start until September 2019, so I won't say anything more about that. What I will tell you about is three known special situations where exact results can really be obtained for Feynman path integrals. So the first case is what I have called localization. And localization is a situation where for some reason the whole theory really reduces down to just a finite dimensional integral which is well defined over the moduli space associated to the situation. So remember I had this uh, Lagrangian defined on the space of fields and I had all the classical solutions, so that's where the derivative of the Lagrangian is zero. That's the solution to a set of PDEs. And then I have a huge group acting on it, and sometimes this quotient is really finite dimensional, and I can actually totally localize this, and it is an exact formula. That is very favorable and very nice situation. In this case, we have a well-defined mathematical definition of what we want. It very often leads to a manageable recursion among these coefficients in the series I talked about before. It's algorithmic and we can really determine everything like the way we like. So let me just give you a few examples of this. So for example, if you take Yang-Mills theory in 2D, this actually devolves to the topology, in fact the cohomology ring of moduli space of flat connections on a compact surface. Uh, sorry, yeah, for a compact surface, but for a compact gauge group, and this was shown uh, a number of years ago by Witten. If you take n equals to 2 Yang-Mills theory in 4D and you consider it on a cross product of two surfaces, then what happens, according to Witten and Kapustin, is that that quantum field theory simply realizes the geometric Langlands program for the Higgs bundle moduli spaces. So that puts it completely firmly on mathematical ground, so that's fantastic. And there are certain simple string theories that in mathematics leads to what we call nowadays gromov witten invariants. These are cohomological pairings on moduli spaces, pseudo-holomorphic curves on symplectic manifolds. It doesn't matter what all of these words mean if you don't know it. The point is that it reduces down to studying topology of these moduli spaces in that case. And therefore we really understand and know what they mean. In fact, in the very special case where you take this symplectic manifold just to be a point, so you can just ignore it completely, then what happens is that you get cohomological pairings on the most classical moduli space we have at all. This is Riemann's moduli space of Riemann surfaces. Uh, and that's the first moduli space we ever introduced. It has uh, 160 years of, uh, of uh, uh, muturation and, uh, and it's a fantastic wine at this point here that studied tons throughout mathematics. It's really a center point and you know this, this guy here features very prominently. We will see that that guy shows up in our RNA study if I get to the end of this talk. Okay, so that was localization. Now comes another possibility, and this other possibility is actually available in principle to all quantum field theories. And that's what I would like to call cutting and pasting. What I mean here is that suppose you have a D plus one dimensional space X which has a boundary Y. Then of course if you consider fields on this X dimensional space, you can restrict the fields to the boundary and you have this, the boundary values on Y. So you have a restriction map from all the fields on X to fields on Y. And now the point is you can simply now define a relative theory where you fix boundary conditions. So you only integrate, you define a function on the space of fields modulo symmetry by simply only integrating, fixing a boundary value A here, and then you only integrate over all the fields that restrict to a given A on the boundary. And so what you're doing, you see, is that suppose you now have two d plus one dimensional spaces in such a way that you have a common boundary. So imagine that you have some kind of bulk here and you've cut it down the middle so you have the left side, I call that minus, and the right side, call that plus. And now the thing is if you want to compute the expectation of observable for the whole thing, 
Well, that's of course this integral we wrote down before, this Feynman path integral. But the point is that you can now reduce it to an integral over the values in the middle, y, and then just taking the uh, kind of Hermitian inner product of these two functions here over that space. So if we abstractly summarize what we have done here, then we're simply saying the theory should associate a vector space with an inner product to things of dimension y. So, sorry, of dimension d, namely this y here. And that we are going to call the state space in dimension d. And then for d plus one dimensional guys, it will associate a vector in the vector space of the boundary of that guy. And then, of course, if I want to know the expectation value of the observable for the whole system, I just take the inner product of those two vectors in this vector space. So this here already tremendously reduces the complexity of the theory. This means that I have to somehow just determine, or just, but I still have to do that, but I have to just determine these vector spaces and then these states in there. Okay, now the so then the question is how can I actually try to construct this vector space in one dimension less than I'm interested in, namely what would be boundary values? Well, in, there is a certain mechanism that sometimes works and that is called geometric quantization, well, of moduli spaces, because we are interested in moduli spaces and of field theories here. So, if you take a field theory, and it's, say, defined on a space of dimension d plus 1, it has its boundary y. Now you consider the classical moduli space of, uh, of the boundary y, and that forms a kind of boundary conditions for the moduli space of solutions on the whole bulk space. And so therefore you have a restriction map from the moduli space of the bulk to the restriction to, to the moduli space of the boundary. And in certain non-degenerate cases, what will happen is that actually uh, the, the guy on the boundary, the moduli space on the boundary, will be equipped with what's called a symplectic structure. This means basically it's equipped with what is known as uh, a classical mechanical system because the symplectic structure determines the classical mechanics. It's a way to encode the classical mechanics. And in fact, if you look at the image of the things from the bulk, they will form what's called a Lagrangian subspace. So they form exactly the basis of a classical field theory. And now the idea is simply, you simply now just quantize this moduli space on the boundary. And there is a prescription for how to quantize finite dimensional symplectic manifolds. Namely, what you do is you first assume or fix, I mean, it, this doesn't always exist, but if it exists, you fix a Hermitian line bundle com with a compatible connection in such a way that the curvature of this connection is given by the symplectic form. And then you fix a polarization. This is a Lagrangian integrable subbundle of the complexified tangent bundle. And this P here could either be a real polarization, which means it's just the tangent spaces to a Lagrangian foliation, or it could be the anti-holomorphic directions with respect to some complex structure on this moduli space, such that the whole thing is scalar with respect to symplectic form, and then you simply define this vector space to be the smooth sections over this moduli space of this line bundle with the property that when you differentiate in the directions of the polarization, you get zero. These are called polarized sections, and now I have a mathematical definition of what the Hilbert space of the theory is. So this is a huge advantage of just these path integrals that are just abstractly floating around and I have no control mathematically over what's going on. Now I actually have a definition, if I'm lucky that it's this situation. So this sometimes works, so this cutting and pasting idea some, somehow can be made to work in certain cases. That's two. Now, uh, yeah, okay, I just have one more remark. It might be that have exactly one p here, but you have a whole family parameterized by some manifold t, where then we ask that these state spaces form a vector bundle over t, and that this bundle admits what's called connection, so some projectively flat connection in that bundle. I'll get back to that later. This is a little technical. But now the final case is somehow taking this cutting and pasting to the extreme. What I want to do now is not somehow just cut the space once, no, I want to somehow thoroughly chop it into pieces, completely chop it up in such a way that I have maybe very, very small pieces of building block. And then I hope to build all spaces from those building blocks. 
And so that's the idea here. So for certain quantum fields, you could really take this cutting and pasting to an extreme. So maybe, and this means the following. So it becomes a purely combinatorial construction. What this means is you imagine that you have a certain finite set of building blocks. So these are d plus one dimensional spaces. And then you have some means of specifying what the expectation value of the observable should be for e in the vector space associated to the boundary of each of the pieces. And second of all, you will then obtain the big thing simply by saying any x can be realized by gluing these building blocks together, and then I'd simply just use this rule here iteratively to specify what this should be for the whole space. This has obvious problems, namely the big challenge is, how do I actually determine these for the pieces? And second of all, how do I make sure the whole thing is independent of how I chop up the space? There might be many, many different ways of chopping up the space. And if they don't give the same thing, of course I won't have succeeded in doing anything. Then it's inconsistent, the theory. So those, there are many examples of such situations. For example, triangulations. So all reasonable spaces are triangulable. And choose, uh, you know, you only have one building block, and that's the d plus one dimensional simplex. So that's fantastic. We only have one guy to deal with. And in fact, it's nice because the Pachner moves, which I will get back to in a second, they actually describe the non-uniqueness of triangulation. So any two triangulations can be related by a number of Pachner moves, so I just have to check that my construction is independent of Pachner moves. In two dimensions, any compact orient surfaces with boundary, they by gluing disc, cylinders, and pair of pants. So there is a great thing. I just need to specify what is the theory doing for disc, for cylinder, and for pair of pants. But then, of course, I have to check it's in, again independent of decomposition. But there are also local moods which accounts for the non-uniqueness. Perfect. Likewise, surgeries, it's a little different than pieces, but in three dimensions, any closed-oriented three-dimensional manifold can be obtained from surgery on a link. And there is something called the Kirby calculus that describes the non-uniqueness. So we have many situations where we have total control over the spaces themselves, and therefore we just have to build quantum field theories on them. And we can do this by this sort of combinatorial method, and that's what I will tell you a little bit about now. Okay, so you see, now you have kind of a, a little mini overview of what one can do in quantum field theory. And now I want to fire it off on some specific quantum field theory. So I just have to check what, where are we in time-wise. Yeah, so that was half an hour minus your presentation. Two minutes. So, <clears throat> so uh, let me try to do a bit about compact. Uh, so so ch qu quantum churn Simons theory with compact real gauge group. <laughs> this is a classical theory that was invented some... 30 years ago, and it has now received lots of attention, and we really know lots of things about it. So if I go a little fast over these slides, it's because I have an ambition of trying to tell you a little bit more. And I want to somehow see if you can somehow get the gist of what has been done there, and maybe not the details. I'll be happy to discuss the details with any of you after the talk. But so, uh, it's actually a really, really beautiful story. So first, I will consider the, the Gates group, SU2. These are special unitary two-by-two two matrices. I will consider a principal G bundle over the three-sphere. In fact, for this G here, and for any connected and simply connected G, this P will simply be isomorphic to a trivial bundle. I will consider as the space of fields, I will consider what people call in physics Gates potentials, which also enter into the standard model. But now I only consider the Gates potentials, no Higgs fields, uh, and the, the, the interaction I will consider is purely topological. But these are called also in mathematics the space of connections on P, and then this uh, principal bundle has a huge symmetry group called the gates, transformations of P, and they act on the space A. And now the theory has observables, classical observables, which are called Wilson lines in physics. You simply just take a closed curve inside your three-sphere, and then what you do is you co produce a function on the space of connections modulo gauge. And what you do is, for a given connection, you compute the holonomy around the closed loop, and then you take the trace and the two-dimensional defining representation of SU2. So this gives a holonomy function. So this is a function on the space of 
uh, fields modular symmetry, so these are classical observables. And we need to understand the expectation value. But with respect to which theory? Well, the theory that we want to consider now is what's called Chern-Simons theory. And Chern-Simons theory, therefore, has a Lagrangian. It's called CS for Chern and Simons. And it's simply described like this. So a connection is a one form of values in the Lie algebra. So that this expression on this side here makes good sense as a three form on the three sphere. You integrate it, and this is a, func this is a number. And this churn simons functional, it's almost gauge invariant in the sense that if you compare the gate, you see this transformation rule here where this is an integer. So therefore, if I'm considering e to the 2 pi k times churn simons where k is an integer, so in other words, I have made 1 over h bar an integer, then this is an invariant quantity. And therefore, I can consider, following what Witten did, quantum churn simons observables, which are just averages over the space of connections modulo symmetry of this quantity here. And still today, we don't know precisely how to, def how to somehow really do this path integral. But the thing is, in this theory, we can actually define the left-hand side. Exact, by one of the methods that I alluded to before, and that's a combinatorial method. But when Witten did this, he didn't care, he's a physicist, so he said, just consider this just like we do in a standard model and so on. And the fantastic thing that he uh, argued in his paper from uh, 1988 was this gives you the Jones polynomial. Now, the Jones polynomial is actually invented by Vaughan Jones uh, four years before that. It is an invariant of knots and links uh, inside the three-sphere. It actually takes values in the Laurent polynomial, and it satisfies the following skein relations. So when you switch crossings, you get this uh, relation here. That means you can compute it on anything, and it's a framed invariant, so it depends on, on, on how you untwist the thing also. And for the trivial knot, it gives you just what, what's called quantum 2. And the quantum integers are, by definition, this expression here. Now, Vaughan Jones did this uh, by considering subfactors and his tower construction for these. That gave him a Markov trace on the uh, on, uh, 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 in... Um, on certain finite dimensional representations of the braid group, and the braid groups are these guys here, and they are just the natural groups that you experience when you consider braidings. Actually, there is still an open question about this. Does there exist a trivial, a non-trivial knot K such that it has trivial Jones polynomial? This is still an open problem, even though we've studied this theory for 35, 40 years maybe, for full hammer. It's very complicated, nice problem. It's a very powerful uh, knot invariant that Vaughan constructed. But it got a tons of attentions because of this, all of a sudden, much more. Because now we sort of, you, you see, what I want to do is I want to say, hey, I know what the Jones polynomial is, that's math. So therefore, I know what this is. And then I just reverse the whole thing. And I'm just going to construct the whole theory. So quickly, that's what I want to do. So we go on, now we simply say, okay, let's take any closed three manifold, let's look at any link inside it, let's do exactly the same thing for any three manifold with a link inside it. We can consider the Chern Simons function, we can consider these Wilson lines, we now have arbitrary representation, this should have been G, I'm sorry, you know, that's U2. And then we look at a very general situation, any three manifold, any link inside it, and we consider exactly the same thing, but now in that situation. And Witten said, this will be a topological quantum field theory. So now I want to, you to basically just have an impressionistic uh, impression of what happened. So what actually happened was that some mathematicians, in particular Atia, who is a fields medalist, and his student Graham Siegel, hit on this and said, okay, Let's just be precise about what axioms is it precisely that constitutes a topological quantum field theory. So they just wrote down a set of rules and said, this is therefore what we should mean by this theory in two plus one dimensions. Stack of axioms, lots of properties, and uh, you know, the two-dimensional part satisfy lots of rules. And then the nice thing was that after they had written down all of these rules, Two Russian mathematicians who do tons about the representation theory, quantum groups, something completely different from this, said, we can actually simply construct something that satisfies all the rules. And therefore, we can totally combinatorially construct this quantum field theory. And that's what they did. So I don't need you to read more of those slides than that. 
Uh, then there was some stuff about basic data, and we had this guy here, another fields metallurgist, Maxim Kontavich, come in and see that that amount of data suffices to determine the whole theory. And then uh, I actually, uh, together with Kenji Ueno, eliminated some part of the, of the data that Maxim was assuming you don't actually really need this. And nowadays there is actually, on top of Resetik and Tureyev's description, there are three more descriptions of this theory. One that uses more topology, one that uses conformal field theory, which is another construction from quantum physics, and then one that uses quantizational moduli spaces, which is the one I've been telling you a little bit about. But the nice thing is, they are all the same. And therefore, we can use all of these different methods to study this quantum field theory. We can use moduli spaces by our result that that's the same as the one that comes from quantum field theory. Also, Laszlo has proved a lot of, on this already. I have, together with Kenji Ueno, proved that the conformal field theory guy is the same as the Skane one, and the Skane one was known a long time ago to be the same as the Wittner is the Ting Tureyev one. So they're all the same, and we, can, and, and we can use different methods. But the thing is that the different ways of constructing this theory is good for different things. They don't all do the, is the same good thing. So, uh, yeah, let's see. I think that I want to somehow skip over this, okay? So here I actually tell you precisely, actually no, this would be a shame here, because uh, just this slide I need to do. Because this slide relates closely to the kind of things that Anna is doing. Because it turns out that this, the, 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 this moduli space, oops, sorry, the moduli space we are talking about that is quantized in this case is the moduli space of flat G connections. And so it turns out that that's simply just this sort of such two G tuples of elements from G that satisfies this one relation modulo G. And so the spaces that Anna are particularly interested in are the spaces that I'm currently disallowing because they, they are for the non-compact group, complex groups, are the real or complex. Right now I'm assuming G is compact, but I will get to the other ones in a second. But they are exactly the moduli spaces of flat connections that Anna has proved fantastic things about. These moduli spaces are symplectic, they have line bundles, they have lots of polarizations, and we can apply the whole scheme of geometric quantization to it. And my former supervisor from Oxford proved that there is this fantastic construction of, the, of a connection that's projectively flat uh, in this bundle, and so therefore we can define mathematically what the, this vector space for the theory is in this case. Okay, and there is a very nice formula that is due to Valinda, a physicist coming from conformal field theory, and it took a lot of mathematicians to actually prove it in all generality. So here are some of the names of the people who are involved. Lots of famous people have worked on that. Uh, now I skip a little bit. Uh, one of the th my contributions to the subject is that I showed that these invariants are really very powerful because on the level of the mapping class group, they don't forget anything. This is called asymptotic faithfulness. One can detect any mapping class by the way that it acts on these vector spaces. But I want to skip quickly past that. But I do want to mention one thing that is maybe interesting for applications of quantum computing, namely this uh, four tuple of people here, Kitaev, Larsen, Wang, and Friedman, uh, proved actually that this Witten Resetin to ray of quantum field theory, if we just apply it to the two sphere and a number of points, and then looking at the braid group acting on this vector space, this is a theoretical universal quantum computer. So if we can realize this theory, and people are really trying very hard to realize this in various connections, quantum Hall effect and so on, we actually get a universal quantum computer. So this theory also has close to applications, and it has lots to do with quantum, with topological phases of matter and so on. Let me continue uh, on. So this is in some sense something that has quite some time behind it. But what we really would like to do is also to understand what happens to the theory if we construct, if we consider complex Lie groups. So this is something that people don't do in the standard model, typically. There, the gauge groups are actually compact. But uh, the, the non-compact spaces are much closer related to geometric structures, as Anna has also uh, contributed to. So therefore, we're very interested in trying to see, can we push this further? 
And in particular, can we do it for a complex group like SL2C or for a real group like SL2R? And that is indeed something that Witten considered very early on. Uh, I think I just want to somehow skip the details of this, but just say that Witten made some considerations on this, again from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Feynman path integral point of view. Again, he finds the same kind of moduli spaces, but he builds the vector space for the theory, but he doesn't really build the theory. And so that's what Renat Kashayev and I have done. We have done the, if you like, we have done the analog of Resitikin Tureyev's work, but for the SL2C gate group. So uh, we presented that in a, in a series of papers here. So I've given you the references uh, here. Uh, I had a paper in the proceedings of ICM that just uh, came out now about this. And so just to highlight that, you know, it is a rigorous mathematical precise construction of complex quantum chain Simons theory. We use combinatorial methods. So we're using this case three of breaking everything into small pieces and then assembling things from these pieces. Uh, so it is similar to the Resetigen to Rave construction in that sense, but where they use surgery and links, we use ideal triangulations. And where theirs were finite sums, their construction, their formulae, ours are integrals, and so we have to worry about convergence and proper decay and so on in the construction. But the idea is to simply consider three-dimensional spaces. And so uh, we also need the following kind of structure on these. We need an ordering of its vertices. And if you look at the symmetry group of the tetrahedron and you consider uh, all tetrahedra with ordered vertices up to that symmetry group, you will find that there is exactly two. And now what we do is we say, let's take any manifold, which is obtained by gluing finitely many of these together. And we invented some kind of nifty diagrammatic formula that tells you precisely how these are glued. Graphs like this. I don't have time to explain how this really goes. But uh, it's kind of nice, and you can do uh, triangulate any three-manifold, and in fact more than that, also cusp three-manifolds this way. And uh, what we further need, and that's very important for the theory to be finite, is we need di dihedral angles. And these are in in inner angles on these tetrahedra. So I want to skip the details again of this. I just want to emphasize that Fedeyev's quantum die logarithm is a very special function that you see right here. It plays a very prominent role in this. And the theory is somewhat complicated because you have to deal with the theory of temperate distributions to make this whole theory work. But in the end of the day, and uh, uh, some complications, I will, you know, Sorry, we, we have a definition of this invariant. I don't want to tell you really where it lives. It's not so important. But the nice thing is that all we have to do is check the invariance under this move. And that's the Pachner move in dimension three. And if you look here, you see a shape in the middle here. And if you take these two trahedra and glue them along this face in the middle here, you get the shape here. But if you take a three peel orange, uh, uh, tetrahedral decomposition of it, as you see in the right. It also gives the shape here, and this is the 2, 3 move, Pachner move. And so what we have to do, we have to check that the theory is invariant under this move. And that's all we have to do, because all triangulations of the same space are related by a sequence of these moves, if they have the same number of vertices. Okay, and so uh, we have formulated a, th a conjecture for this theory here, namely that this theory here knows the hyperbolic volume of the three manifold that we're looking at. In particular, if you take uh, one with one cusp, so any, if you, if you want, you can take any hyperbolic not complement, it can be triangulated with one cusp, uh, so with one, uh, one vertex in, in the quotient space, and then we say that there is a function which is depending on two variables, and this here is a generalization of the color Jones polynomial to this theory. In fact, one here we have already proved now, so uh, the slides are slightly uh, outdated, but one has been proved, so we know that the whole theory just reduces down to this one function, but we do not know that this one here, and we really would like to prove that. We know it, for example, for 4, 1, and 5, 2, two special knots, we have explicit formulae for these, and we can check that this is satisfied in that case. 
Okay, there's a way to generalize this to complex transcendence theory. I will skip that completely. And I also, I think, want to skip the next part. So even though this, I think, is very nice, uh, so this is some stuff I've done with Gukov and Pei, a student, a common student postdoc of us. And what we do is we actually prove a generalization of this Belinda formula in, for Higgs bundles, and it's really nice, and it's a one plus one dimensional TQFT, blah, blah, blah. But I want to show you some applications. So whoever fell asleep by now, and that's maybe a number of you, time to wake up again, if you like, if you're interested in molecular biology, because now uh, we change the discussion a little bit. So I want to tell you about the RNA secondary structure problem and pseudonauts. So I'm using the biology terminology here. So RNA primary sequence is simply a word in four letters. And what you want to do in the RNA folding problem is that you want to predict, yeah, in principle, the tertiary structure. But the thing is that we don't know so many RNA tertiary structures. For proteins, we know lots of tertiary structures, but for RNA, we don't know so many. However, what we do know is who is hydrogen bonded to who? This is very easy for people to measure. And there are big databases with lots of information about that. So the secondary folding problem is to, given a primary sequence, predict what is the secondary structure, meaning who's hydrogen bonded to who when the RNA folds on itself, which it does. OK. Now, secondary here simply means that it can be written of this form here. Dot means no hydrogen bond at all. And parenthesis means either open or close the hydrogen bond. So if you can write it like this, there will be no hydrogen bonds which, so to speak, cross each other. I'll get back to what this precisely means in a second. But such a thing here is called a secondary structure. OK. So one way to deal with this secondary structure, or to describe it a different way, is that you can simply think of the RNA as being lined out here with its backbone, and I draw a little arc in the upper half plane every time that I see a bond. Okay? And, now the, and now it really means that I want to consider only such things where there are no arcs that cross each other. These are precisely the secondary structures, and there is a very nice algorithm for uh, you know, solving this RNA folding problem when its secondary structures were developed by White Mike Waterman some 40 years ago. And here, here's sort of an outline of how this goes. The first step is that it is rather easy to lay out this structure here on the sequence if you just have the bracketing itself. Basically, you sprinkle in the empty slots sort of everywhere. And it, it, it's sort of algorithmic and fast to get from this to that. So the only thing we have to worry about is actually only this. And now, how do we generate all such things? Well, if you look at them as diagrams like this, there is a very simple way, thing you can do. If you take the first arc and you remove it and you chop at its endpoint, what you discover is that you get two s s uh, diagrams which are of exactly the same nature. Right? So this is an obvious recursive way to construct everything. It's to take two arbitrary diagrams, stick them together, and put one more arc on like this. Let's see if we can actually then count how many diagrams we have. Because let's define C0 of n to be the number of n arc, and that they, these guys are called reduced when they don't have any empty slots, secondary structures. And then what you see from this recursive process here is that if you want C0 with one more chord, it is simply a sum over having I chords, sorry, I call them chords, but they are these arcs in the upper half plane, I guys here and N minus I here, and then you insert one more to get this. So therefore, they satisfy this recursion here, the counting. Well, that's exactly the Catalan numbers, right? And so we know exactly how to solve the full uh, generating series. It can, we can give it explicitly. It's given like that. And so Mike Waterman did this, and he developed a corresponding algorithm to predict the free energy for these uh, folds. And he was able to predict the true structure with quite a high pro, uh, precision. And this has been refined over time. And this is something that people are really, really good at by now. Sorry, I went backwards. But what if we have such guys, namely where they cross? 
Well, there is some very bad news from my home country, Denmark. Namely, these two guys, Lyngsø and Peterson from the Danish Technical University, proved in 2000 that if you want those guys as well, the problem is NP-complete. Which currently somehow seems to be the same thing as saying uh, no go. So you cannot hope to develop an algorithm that deals with such things also in complete generality. And these guys are called pseudonauts. The biologists call these pseudonauts. However, then what? Uh, we d did, here's some reference list, we did some work on this. And I'm now going to, I could have started the whole discussion over on moduli spaces. But I won't. I will continue in this kind of vein of very simple understanding, understandable math or, or, or sort of science, and then move my way over to moduli space. We actually somehow started at it oppositely, but nevertheless. But here's the basic idea. I, our idea was simply to say, let's not consider all the diagrams, but let's filter the diagrams. And there is a very simple way that you can take such a pseudonaut and filter them. Namely, and this is simply considering these guys as Feynman diagrams of a quantum field theory. Because if you do that, then you must turn these into a fat graph, but that's very easy, just take the planar projection and just fatten everything up to small bands and attach them together, so then you get a little skinny surface. And this skinny surface has a genus. This genus is a mathematical characteristic that classifies all surfaces which are orientable and with boundary. The genus and the number boundary component completely determines this guy. And so there is a formula for G in terms of the number of arcs and then the number of boundary components that the little skinny surface has. And now there is the following observation. An RNA diagram has no crossing arcs if and only if its genus is zero. So somehow the genus is the one we can really deal with. That's the ones Mike Waterman already de dealt with us for. And now... Uh, yeah, I just remind you that a reduced diagram is one with no unbounded vertices. But now the idea, let's just consider them genus by genus. So let's first consider the generating function where I fix the genus and I can want to understand. First, let's, numerology is typically the first thing you want to do, count the number of possibilities. So we're going to define CG of N to be the number of reduced RNA diagrams of genus G with N arcs. And then we would like to understand this generating function here. Uh, I am going to entirely skip this altogether. It's a shame somehow, but I want to do this because I want to go here. Because we didn't know how to solve this problem, and we couldn't solve it actually. However, what we managed to do was to relate it to a problem people had solved in quantum field theory. So uh, we go now to 1860. And we consider, again, what I talked about before, Riemann's moduli space. This is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with S number of mark points. And so it can indeed be defined to be take the space of all hyperbolic metrics on the complement of the punctures, make, it, make, the, make sure they're complete. I think I said that, yes. And then you take that space and you divide by all orientation-preserving diffeomorphisms and you will end up with this finite dimensional moduli space. Oldest moduli space in mathematics. Introduced by one of the founding fathers of modern mathematics, Riemann. It turns out that uh, this moduli space actually has a very nice complex structure. It's a smooth orbifold. This is due to another Fields medalist, uh, Mumford, who proved that in the 60s. And once he proved that, that somehow focused a lot of attention on this moduli spaces. And a student of Thurston and my friend and collaborator, uh, Bob Penner, in the 1980s actually found a cell decomposition, so a combinatorial description of this moduli space, which is indexed by connected fat graphs with S univalent vertices, and all other valences are at least three, and they must be of genus T, and they must have S boundary components. And so these S boundary components become in correspondence with these S univalent vertices. So if you consider this finite set of graphs, that describes cells. And it's very, very easy to describe what the cells are, because you just look at these graphs and you think of all possible metrics there are on these. So just consider a length on each of the edges, and if a length goes to zero, you just pop the edge and a incre uh, you know, just fuse the ones that came into two N vertices to one vertex. 
So that's actually the cell structure of this module. It's purely combinatorial. Okay, let me just see what I have on the second. Yeah. So uh, we get back to that in a second, or in the very end of the talk, I get back to this. But now the fantastic thing was somehow this. So it turns out that if you consider certain diagrams, and now I regret that I skipped the slides that I did about a few seconds ago. So I must go a little bit back and just tell you one notion. And that is of RNA shapes. The thing is that basically what you do is you collapse everything that has to do with genus zero. And if you do that, you will end up, oops, with a, so a, 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 an RNA shape is an RNA reduced diagram where every stack size is one, stack size is this. So this is stack size two, this is stack size three. And there's no one arcs, this is a one arc. And there is a rainbow, you can forget about that, that's just a technical detail, this is a rainbow. But these two guys are shapes, these are not. And it turns out that there is a sort of way to go from any diagram to its shape, and there's a way to expand from, all, from shapes all other diagrams. So that's what's going on on this slide here. The point is, that the shapes determine everything for RNA in terms of counting functions. And now the thing is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between shapes in RNA and the fat graphs that Bob wants to triangulate this classical moduli space. So a perfect match between something that's utterly unrelated, I thought at least, to biology, which is this very theoretical, technical, classical moduli space, the oldest one of there is, and its combinatorial structure, and then RNA. So the thing is, once we uh, got that information, we could simply look at the books and see, hey, Hara and Saki already studied this uh, combinatorial gadget, and they computed how many cells there is, and they actually already solved our recursion problem. Here's the solution. That's the, I mean, that's the recursion relation, these numbers satisfy. And in fact, they proved that uh, the generating function has this form here where there are certain polynomials. And these polynomials, they are, however, a little bit funny because as far as our computers can go, these polynomials all have positive coefficients, they have a funny factorization property, and none of those two things we can explain. We don't know what these count. They surely must count something. All their integers are positive, so they're counting something. I don't know what they're counting. The great problem, combinatorial problem. Anyway, all shapes can be deduced from this, and then the whole thing just started rolling completely. You know, this is the conjecture I just talked about. So what we did was actually, so let me quickly go through all of this. We somehow implemented that in such a way that it takes care of what people care about in biology, about stack size and blah, blah, blah. The point is we really programmed this all the way to an algorithm uh, which could predict uh, pseudonauts on RNA, it uh, has O of n to the 6, unfortunately, runtime, and it's O of n to the 4 in memory, but we were very happy that it outcompeted any other software on the market uh, uh, for prediction. So we took it all the way to applications here. Okay, uh, I don't know how much time I have. I think maybe if minus a few minutes or something. Ah, still have three. Okay, <laughs> so I will finish with the very last slides. The nice thing about these things is there is actually a matrix model that counts these diagrams. And what a matrix model is, is the following. It's an integral over n by n Hermitian matrices of e to the minus n times the trace of some function applied to the matrix. And then what you're interested in is the exp this kind of expansion, where the coefficients here are called free energies. And so what we proved was that if you take this function here of two variables, then the G's term encodes exactly all the genus G guys with all number of uh, backbones. So you can, it, an RNA can of course be a multi-RNA with several backbones linked together. And so this matrix model here counts all the possible uh, RNA combinatorics that you want to understand. And so let me just end with the following remark that Mumford, so going back to Mumford again, and this moduli space, he uh, defined a certain set of tautological classes on this moduli space. And what happened was that Witten actually introduced a certain path, integra if path integral formulation of these evaluations, these tautological classes, and he kind of gave it as a challenge to the community how to somehow figure out how to evaluate all of these. And 
one of the reasons why Kantsevich got the Fields Medal was actually because he solved that path into goal, and he solved it by using the same thing as we're using here, namely Penner's cell decomposition, this moduli space, and he reduced it to a matrix model, which is very similar to this one, but just slightly different than this one here. So it's, again, the same thing that the quantum field theory techniques solved the problem. In this case, it wasn't exactly RNA counting, but a slightly different problem it was very important in math. But similar techniques also solves problem in, in biology, as this has illustrated. So, okay, thanks a lot for, for staying with me. I rushed through some of the things, and if any of you want to ask questions, you are most unwelcome, and I'll discuss afterwards also. Thank you.